Hey everybody, my name is Blake Morgan and you are tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Our next guest is Will Guadara. He is the former co-owner of the restaurant 11 Madison Park, which was named number one on the list of the world's best restaurants. He's the author of five books, including the newest Unreasonable Hospitality, which has been making waves in the business world and was even featured on the TV show about the restaurant industry and chefs called The Bear. Today we're talking about unreasonable hospitality and how that applies to the contact center. We're talking about the state of customer service and we're talking about the small wins you can make every single day to create a customer focused culture. Please enjoy Will Guidara. Will Welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Are you in New York City today? I am in New York City. I'm on 26th between 5th and 6th as we talk. So your book is, well, for, for firstly, it's really popular. Like everyone, it's everywhere. It's on TV. It's, <laughs> you know, you're on the speaking circuit. So I think your message really resonated with people. But let's go back for those who don't know you and you know you're you're into food you're interested in this world and you just sort of you're at the right place at the right time can you just give us the high level of how you came into the restaurant world yeah for sure um i mean the 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 shortest story is i grew up in it my dad was a restaurateur um and so literally with the exception of one summer that i spent as a camp counselor at my high school summer camp it's the only thing i've ever done for a living um, yeah. I was, I was pretty enamored with my dad growing up. And so it probably didn't really matter what he did for a living. That's what I would have wanted to do. Um, but I was fortunate that the thing he did do was something that I completely fell in love with. I was always, I would always go to work with him um, when I was a kid, because anyone who's ever worked in a restaurant knows that restaurant hours are long hours. And if you want to pursue a relationship with your dad and he works in restaurants, it means you go to where he is. And I was always enchanted by the controlled chaos, by the fact that in a single room, I remember thinking this and having conversations with him on the drive back to our house at the end of a night, like all of life's experiences were taking place under one roof concurrently and one table there could be a business dinner and another table, a first date and another table, a wedding anniversary and another table, friends reuniting. Um, mm -hmm. And it was always just enchanting to me, not to mention the fact that, well, in addition to all the creative elements of running a restaurant, I mean, you just get to make people happy by throwing a big party every single night. And even as a kid, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Yeah. And you didn't have the easiest childhood. I think that that initially really pulled me in with your story that, I mean, you had some really, really big challenges. I know your mom wasn't well and you had to take care of her and you just went through a lot as a little kid. Yeah. I mean, you know, what's interesting is that it all happened when I was so young that I didn't know a different reality. Um, mm -hmm. And so it never struck me as, as difficult, right? Because that was just the life that we lived. My mom was a quadriplegic. My dad and I took care of her together as a team. Um, and when I look back at my upbringing, I mean, it's because of life's experiences that we all end up being who we are right mm -hmm. and and i owe i think a lot of what i've become to the adversity that my family faced and my mother's sickness listen if i could go back in time obviously i would change things and she'd be healthy and still alive and with us today and hanging out with my my kids but um my dad and I are so much closer because of the fact that she was handicapped and we needed to be a team to care for her. And I think honestly, caring for her is what taught me so early in life, how much pleasure 
one can derive in being of service to others and being called to serve. So, well, what I find really interesting about you, even just talking to you now, is you are so calm and like peaceful and relaxed. But the person that I got to know through reading your book is a very intense, hardworking, I won't say aggressive, but you know, you worked your butt off and you weren't shy as a manager that that was the expectation that everyone should aim for perfection. Obviously perfectionism, you know, it doesn't exist, but it's just interesting to me, like how you seem versus what's inside. But I think that's the <laughs> essence of customer experience. It's like, how do you bring humanity to business, but also understand that every day is game day, that everything you do matters. So can you just talk about your style and how that impacted your career and the work at 11 Madison Park? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I do believe that the best leaders are those that bring a certain steadiness to the job and you can be intense and ambitious and have extraordinarily audacious goals and at times need to dig deep into the tank and show those around you the fire that they sometimes need to see to be called to greatness. But I, I've always tried to reserve <laughs> intensity for moments that require it and and bring a more even keeled energy to to the balance of the day um i i believe that when you're trying to accomplish anything of significance it's important to acknowledge that it's a marathon not a sprint um and what that requires is yeah i guess being reasonably um even tempered as much of the time as possible such that you have enough gas in the tank to get all the way to where you're trying to go. In your book and just in your work, a lot of what I gather is that you're a coach and that's a lot of being a good manager is coaching your people. And in your book, you recommend that something that you did at the restaurant 11 Madison Park was you just spent a lot of time with your team and every day you had a 30 minute meeting and, and if anyone's interested, you can watch the bear because I feel like the bear just took your story <laughs> and like replicated it. But, you know, I get this sense that your work at 11 Madison Park, um, and we haven't really told our listeners and viewers that aren't familiar, like what you did to make this restaurant number one in the world, but you did a lot of coaching with your people, your staff. Can you just talk about the art of being a good coach? Yeah, I think that there's a point in your career where you need to make the decision whether you're a player or you're a coach. And I think the moment that you are faced with that decision is an extraordinarily important one because how you respond defines your capacity to succeed. Um, and I like to use the baseball metaphor that no team will ever win the World Series without a coach. But a team could win the World Series with even if they lose their star pitcher. Um, mm -hmm. I think when, when, whenever you're managing a multifaceted operation, which most are, right? If anyone looks at their business, there are a lot of people that require a lot of different skill sets, doing a lot of different things and playing different roles. No one individual can be the best at all of those roles. The way to scale your capacity is instead to focus on being a good coach, a good leader, and bringing the best out of all of those people such that every element of your business has the ability to be best in class. And if you focus as intentionally and as relentlessly on being the best coach you can be, as most successful people have at one point or another focused on being the best doer they can be at whatever they did to get to that point in their career it's pretty amazing what you can accomplish and so yes in my world we did that in a bunch of different ways first as you pointed out spending a ton of time perhaps even an unreasonable amount of time getting to know everyone on the team um, i think that's so crucial um whether it is a just to get to know them as people b to get to know them as professionals C, to unpack the things that they are great at, their hidden talents, so that you have the ability to leverage those talents 
for their own benefit and for that of the team as a whole. Um, and as importantly, like D, because in getting to know everyone on the team, you get the best picture of what's actually happening within the operation. Um, if you hear from every single individual what they think is working, what they don't think is working, what about the decisions the company is making are bringing them joy, and what about the same decisions that are not bringing them joy, in culmination, you have the information required to actually navigate forward in the best possible way. And then finally, listen, I, I don't believe someone can be a great leader unless the people on their team trust them. And I think one of the best ways to earn the trust of the people that work for you is to show that you care about them and you're willing to invest the time to get to know them. Because A, that shows you care and they are more inclined to trust you. And that also gives them the ability to get to know you, which is important to trust anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think coaching is everything. I mean, like you look at some of the great coaches in, in the world of sports, and I think there's so much we can learn from them on how to be better leaders of our teams. So one of the biggest challenges with customer experience is scaling. And when I think about what you did 11 Madison Park, like you did surprise and delight before there really was this business phrase of what it was. And I think you can only do surprise and delight, Will, when you have the basics down, when your operations, when you're running a tight ship, then you can go and, you know, go find the beer and the hot dog and put champagne in the customer's you know, fridge for their anniversary and do all these things that will go, wow, make them go, wow. But one of the hardest things to achieve is that culture that you created where people are excited to show up to work at the restaurant. They feel pride, they feel honored to be there. And so they show up as their best selves. What advice do you have for other businesses that want to create that customer centric culture, but they really don't know where to start? Well, I mean, my biggest piece of advice is just start. And, and the reason why I actually feel strongly about that is because one of the best ways to build a culture where people are inclined to want to go above and beyond is to give them a taste of how good it feels to go above and beyond. I don't think there's anything more energizing than the look on someone else's face once they receive a gift you're responsible for giving them. and when you talk about how to create an environment where people um, feel a connection to the mission, I believe giving them the permission and the resources to go above and beyond for people is, well, is one of the most effective ways to accomplish that. And so it's almost the chicken or the egg. I think some people say they can't do that because they don't have a team that's excited to do it. But until the team feels firsthand how good it feels to do it, then they're not going to get excited. And so sometimes you need to just start by doing and then watch as the culture infills behind that. Right. And so, you know, my listeners and viewers, a lot of them run contact centers. They run customer service. And the contact center is a very operations heavy world, which I'm sure you know, because you've been speaking to so many groups all over the world now. But the contact center is not a place usually for romance, for whimsy. It's usually a place where the business just wants to keep the cost as low as possible, which to us, you know, is a missed opportunity. It's the place where the customer actually interacts with the business. What advice do you have for people that run contact centers that that aspire to be better at customer experience? What, what can they start doing that they're not doing? Well, if the focus is on, on efficiency and, and profitability alone, I can almost go so far as to guarantee you that you will be less efficient and less profitable. Um, listen, the contact center is, in effect, my dining room. Right, those are the frontline people that dictate the extent to which people either feel a connection to the brand or don't. Um, I don't care how amazing my restaurant is. If you sit at one of my tables and the person that cares for you, that is there to serve you, 
does it in a way that doesn't make you feel loved or cared for or seen or whatever, valued, then you're going to hate the restaurant. The same is true when I pick up the phone to call whatever big company, right? The person that answers that phone is now for me, that company. And so if that person doesn't feel empowered, if they're following a long uh, script that disables them from bringing their most fully realized self to the table, they're no longer a human being, they're a play actor, so I have an inability to feel a connection to them. So like dial back the scripts and let people be people. If there's such a long list of rules of what they are and are not allowed to do, then, I mean, that is the most frustrating thing in the world as a consumer when you're talking to someone, but it might as well be a robot because they don't have the ability to do anything for you. Um, One of the things I always suggest businesses do is look very, very, very closely at their rules. And every so often do an audit of sorts where they have to prove why each rule still deserves to exist as opposed to the way it normally works, which is rules only get added. And on the rare occasion that one does get removed, it's because someone is persistent enough to cut through all the red tape and convince someone why it no longer deserves to exist. The rules stand in the way of teams feeling empowered. And if a team doesn't feel empowered, it's impossible for a customer to feel seen and valued. Um, And so those are my biggest pieces of advice. Focus less on efficiency. You will be more efficient. Empower your team and stop trying to over control every single thing they do. And the people on the other end of that line will feel like they're actually talking to a human being, a thinking, feeling person. In the absence of thinking that connection is impossible and get rid of some of the rules such that we all feel like we're actually talking to someone who can care for us. Because I've seen, an, I've seen even the most hospitable people come off as extraordinarily inhospitable because they've been stripped of their ability to do what's right in the moment. I love that. I think everybody should take a listen that, that yes, look at your rules, like obsessively. Um, let, I'm really interested, Will, to hear your perspectives on the state of customer service today. Um, you know, some analyst firms say customer service is just down because companies are tired from COVID and they just don't want to invest anymore. What are your feelings on the state of customer service today? I mean, I, I try not to speak in, in generalizations. Um, I've experienced some of the worst customer service I have ever experienced over the course of the last couple months um, where, by the way, it's always been driven by exactly what I just said, um, where I'm like talking to people in customer service roles who I can tell want to do the right thing, but have not been set up and trusted to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the things I always tell leaders is the more trust you give people, the more trustworthy they become, the more responsibility you give people, the more responsible they become. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, We're designing roles to minimize mistakes and in doing so making so many bigger mistakes. Um, but also I've had amazing customer service. I, I think generally the way that most big companies are managing their people is leading to bad customer service because they're not treating their people like people. And yeah. if that's the case, then just automate it entirely. It'll be better. Um, but I'm not, I'm not like a, a doomsday person where I think all hope is lost because I don't think the customer service issues we have are based on the fact that there are not so many people out there that derive pleasure out of doing the right thing for people. I just think they're stuck in these organizations that are restricting people's ability to care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I mean, have you seen any examples of amazing customer service? I know you have 
people send you examples of unreasonable hospitality all the time and you share them on your Instagram? Is there one that stands out or even for you personally? I mean, endless, endless stories. Um, I mean, I'll tell you like, you know, a couple, a couple like legends. And when, when I say legends, what I mean is I'm talking about like these one-off moments of improvisational hospitality that become legends because they're stories that people want to tell over and over and over again. And one I just shared recently is this company um, in Australia that runs like really cool versions of like Dave and Buster's effectively. They're like arcades with games and cocktails and food that done very, very well. Yeah. Um, called Funcade. And this is one of my favorites that I've received recently. Um, a mother had booked a birthday party for her 13 year old son, um, doing his favorite thing in the world, laser tag. Um, but a couple weeks before the party, she called to cancel it because no one had RSVP'd, not a single person. He'd been getting bullied a lot at school and there was no one that wanted to be his friend that wanted to show up and celebrate his party. Not only did the venue refund the deposit, but they said, hey, still come in because we're going to throw you your kid a birthday party. And a bunch of the people on the team took the night off and they played laser tag with the kid and they all bought him birthday presents. And mm -hmm. when you think about that, A, I guarantee it was really fun for the people that worked there to be able to play that role in someone's life and make what was undoubtedly one of the worst years of this kid's life, like a little bit sweeter and to give it a silver lining, a moment that made the year on a whole, not nearly as bad as it could have been. And I guarantee you, I mean, the mom, they, they sent me that story. I posted it. I guarantee you that story has been shared thousands of times and so many people are going to be so much more willing to pay whatever to that business just to support the kind of people that do the right thing. And um, that's a beautiful one. But then I think there are plenty that are not improvisational. They're not legends. Um, they're just companies that have figured out how to systemize hospitality. Here's a great example. Um, I fly to London for work with some regularity and i always take the red eye obviously uh, but the red eye from new york to london is hard because the flight's just not long enough to actually get a good night's sleep and so you're right. always tired when you get there and you, the, when you do it enough the whole secret is to fall asleep as quickly as you can when you get on the plane <laughs> and wake up as late as you can right yes. before landing what is that, so six right hours, before, seven hours from Yeah, here? at best, at best, it's six hours. And okay. right when you get on the plane, the, 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 the flight attendants are always like, do you want us to wake you up for breakfast? And the answer is obviously no. You're not going to lose an hour and a half of your precious five and a half hours of sleep for a very mediocre breakfast in the sky. What that means, though, is you get off the plane tired and uncaffeinated and hungry. So I flew JetBlue Mint recently. And when I landed, I woke up, as always, the last possible mint, and there was this little bag hanging on a hook. And I opened it up, and there was a can of cold brew coffee, a bottle of green juice, and a bag of granola. Mm. They basically saw what was happening to so many other people over and over and over again. And just tried to be a little bit more creative and intentional in how they served people. That was systemized. It didn't require any inherent hospitality um, in any of the, the flight attendants. They systemized graciousness into the process simply by identifying a recurring pattern and then deciding in advance how to be more gracious in response. And I think that's very, very inspiring because it shows that no matter how big your company is, if you're thoughtful enough, you can ensure that everyone you're serving receives moments like that. Yeah, and when they happen, it's always shocking because it very rarely happens. And you just can't believe somebody treated you so wonderfully. Yeah, that they were thoughtful enough to actually 
care a little bit more and try a little bit harder. Yeah, I mean, when I think about your restaurant and I think about running um, a very high end, you know, Michelin star restaurant, you know, it's a very almost militaristic feeling in, in many of these restaurants because, you know, the, the way the kitchens speak, the way that, you know, yes, chef, and everyone, everything has to be perfect. The timing, the way the server serves the meal, which side, everything is very exacting. And then you're also saying, you know, but we're going to actually put like a, like a Disneyland experience on top of that. It's really brilliant. And, um, it seems like first you have to get your, your house in order and then you can play. Is that, is that the uh, formula? Would you say? Yes, to an extent, but I, I want to just caveat it in the following way. You don't need to be perfect, perfect before you focus on hospitality, because if that's the goal, then you're never going to start focusing on hospitality. It's about pushing the two envelopes simultaneously. You can't push one without the other. Um, and that, before I sold the restaurant, was the secret to our success, was that hospitality and excellence are not friends. There's tension between them, right? One is about controlling. One is about empowering. One is about coloring within the lines. The other is about coloring outside of the lines. Um, but our success came because of that tension, not in spite of that tension. I think when people find themselves pursuing two conflicting goals, they way too often choose to abandon one and instead just focus on the other. But when you lose the tension between conflicting goals, you're holding yourself back from the ability to truly innovate. At the time, I'm personally curious about this. You know, at the time you're working probably 14, 16 hour days, maybe longer. Did you know that you were building something so special that there would be like a TV show basically made about it? Or did you just, <laughs> were you just so engaged in what you were doing? You never really zoomed out to see the, the meaning and, and, and how big this would be. I mean, I knew I was building something that I thought was special, which is why working 16 hours a day never felt like I was working 16 hours a day. I was so passionate about it and so in love with it and having so much fun with it, even on the hard days. And there were plenty of hard days. Um, but no, I, I, I definitely did not. I did not think that one day there's going to be a whole TV show based on it. I think like, and I, and I think probably had I known that it would have gotten in the way of, of doing the things that allowed it to happen, honestly. Yeah. And last question before we just do a quick rapid fire. Did you have a surprise? I'm sure the answer is no, but I'm going to ask anyway. Did you have a surprise and delight budget? I know you wanted to do these things every day at the restaurant, or is it just something you did with your gut? We, we basically did it with our gut. I mean, listen, like, and, and I would look at the budget with my gut. Um, though, honestly, the only times I ever sat down with the team to talk about how much money we were spending on surprise and delight was when I felt like we weren't spending enough. Okay. Um, I think that the way that surprise and delight should be treated on your profit and loss statement should be equivalent to um how you think about revenue not how you think of expenses um when someone is being compensated based on financial performance they're celebrated when they exceed revenue and um celebrated when they go below budget on expenses i think if you are under investing in relationships if you're under investing in your surprise and delight budget yes it might help you hit your numbers one month but it'll make it much more difficult for you to hit them down the road mm -hmm. yeah i love that you've got a lot of amazing one-liners in this podcast <laughs> the title of your next book um i want to get to know you a little bit are you ready to take some rapid fire questions before we wrap Let's do it. Okay. Well, what's the most important part of your morning routine? Uh, physically, coffee. Emotionally, um, snuggling with my two and a half year old in bed.
Oh, do you have a unique leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today? Um, journaling. I journal every single night. Um, not that long. It could be a 30 second journaling session. It could be a 10 minute journaling session. It's when you hold on to perspective, it's when you grab on to inspiration, or it's when you reflect on the day and recognize that you did something that you weren't necessarily super proud of and someone on your team deserves an apology the next day. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? I like to order something delicious to be delivered to my apartment and binge watch whatever television show I'm excited about. That is literally my next question. What television show are you streaming right now? Oh, right now, I just started Lupin season three last night with my wife. It's actually so good. I just love the way that show makes you feel because it's just so beautifully shot in Europe. You just feel like it. I, it's I love amazing. That it's beautiful. All right, next question. What is your favorite leadership book or resource? Um, the one I've purchased the most times over the years is The One Minute Manager by Ken Blanchard, which okay. I think is a master class on how to thoughtfully give and receive feedback. What's your idea of perfect happiness? Hmm. <laughs> I'll let you know when I figure that out. <laughs> but. <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's the pursuit. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess I don't think there is such a thing. Um, okay. And, and I say that because it's something I've stopped chasing. I, I find myself in a constant pursuit, or I have found myself in a constant pursuit of perfect happiness. And what it has led to is a state of, persistent discontent i yes. think for me happiness is just appreciating that who knows where it's all going and as long as you know you're doing your best work as an individual in life and in work that you're showing up for the people you love and producing the best results you can in a way that doesn't call your integrity into question that's all we can do and then just celebrate things as they come. And what's your favorite type of vacation? It used to be road trips. I love getting in a car and exploring some different part of the world. Now that I have a two and a half year old and an eight month old, road trips have lost their luster. <laughs> yeah. uh, and now I like going to a beach where they can find joy in the sand for hours on end. Yeah, absolutely. And if you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Um, it would be my mom. I would love to be able to have lunch with my mom. And if you could describe your outlook in one quick motto, what is it? Find the people that you love and pursue your relationships with them with creativity and intention forever. That's wonderful. Well, I am so excited that you were on the show. And if everybody wants to contact you or order your book, where can they do that? Um, I mean, I'm on all the normal social media places at W. Gader on Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, my book is available wherever people buy books. And uh, if you go to unreasonablehospitality.com, you can sign up for the newsletter we're doing right now, which is called Premial, which is that 30 minute meeting we talked about, um, which is the newest thing I'm working on that I'm really excited about and having a lot of fun with. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Um, hope you'll come back on the show and continue to tell us about all of your incredible ideas and all the fun stuff you have um, in store. So thank you for being here. All of you have been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Uh -huh.